Yeah, well, my background initially is, is, is a nurse who used to work on an acute assessment unit where we would take people who were deliberately self-harmed or, as some of the language now, were on sections. Uh, but the issue for me was I was constantly being told by practitioners or other uh, practitioners to restrain, stop or prevent somebody leaving in the absence of a section. Okay. Which clearly is uh, um, illegal. Yeah. And so I became quite interested as a nurse from the point of view of that. Uh -huh. So I did my undergraduate law degree and then uh, I went on and did my PhD within the realms of uh, medical ethics, looking at issues around consent, looking uh -huh. at relational autonomy and concepts like that. And so my PhD was dealing with that area. Uh, and as part of my, na my role now within the, the context of uh, East Beckett University, which is where I work, is that I'm involved in teaching mental health law and policy, medical law and ethics, mm -hmm. uh, research methods for my sins, <laughs> and uh, which is quite a broad spectrum. Yeah. Uh, and I also uh, am a member of the uh, Research Ethics Committee, uh, so sort of the uh, committee which oversees the multiple applications at usually level seven and PhD level. Mm -hmm. And, and that aside, I'm also a, a lay member on one of the uh, Bradford Research Ethics Committees looking at research in the context of vulnerable people. Okay. So that's, that's my background. Uh -huh. And you, because you were talking about some of the, so when you're on the Ethics Committee, you, you were talking before about some of the, some of your priorities when an application comes to you. So the kind of things that you're looking for, what, what gives you confidence, what up rings alarm bells. So. Sure, sure. When I see a Research Ethics uh, Committee application, no matter where I'm sitting, uh, my predominant concern is to ensure that it's written clearly and cogently so I can get a feel for the fact that the researcher themselves knows what they're talking about. Uh -huh. And so that usually does engender or require quite a substantive piece of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I appreciate some of the procedures to, to follow, so you know, I think some of the advice given today about looking at other people's and how they're structured around that particular thing is ideal. But my primary concern is, yes, I think research is important, uh, but it's also about you know, making sure that the service user who's at the end of this research is uh, included in a positive manner mm -hmm. and that there is some empowerment going there rather than disempowerment and there's something coming out which is meaningful for them, mm -hmm. really. So my, my primary concern is to ensure that uh, the approach is robust, the researcher understands what they're talking about, and I don't mean uh, grilling them to the point of death. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually, an o it, the, the Conversation Research Ethics Committee uh, should be open and it should be a case of, tell me about your research. Yeah. Okay. And actually listening rather than questioning all the time because if you, if you allow somebody to to talk, who understands what they're doing, they tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. And all you need them to do is sort of pick up a few points and just to, just to expand. A bit like doing a PhD, by uh -huh. yeah. uh, And so, as I say, my, my thing is just to ensure that they've thought about their research, they have the appropriate methodology and method, that they've considered the ethical process, because listen to what some of our, our colleagues and peers were saying today, was uh, perhaps sometimes they don't always and I don't mean that in a, in a negative uh -huh. sense. They just seem to think, well, I'm going to consider X, Y, and Z, and this is the methodology, and this is the method, mm -hmm. without actually connections. Yeah, of how it'll happen, yeah. what it'll look like yeah. in practice. And so then going back to the original point, I think there's, there's two issues. There's a disconnect between pra people who are doing, you could argue, real-world or practical research, mm -hmm. and that, that's not a pejorative term. Mm -hmm. It's people who are, who are hybrid researchers, mm -hmm. and researchers who are purely... Uh, working in an academic environment who mm -hmm. have less of those hurdles to jump through. Usually re practitioners who are research are looking at vulnerable, vulnerable groups mm -hmm. and that's the issue. And there's usually a disconnect between academic researchers who are at level one mm -hmm. or level two rather than level three. So but for you guys it's, it's, it's a bit of a more, seemingly more robust process but I think you're capable of doing that clearly. And I think the issue is, as long as you can articulate that, we're happy. Yeah, okay. So it's, it's, it's ensuring your research is robust and the service user is not going to be disadvantaged mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. That's all we're looking at. And one of the things that came out of the discussion, you mentioned a disconnect between um, the ethics committee, if you like, and the practitioner or maybe the practice world. Um, one of the examples that came up in the discussion was about the idea of um, ethics committees asking a researcher to display posters in, in a, a home setting or a service user's home setting. Sure. Um, Whereas within the home and within that kind of world, there was a, a strong um, a, a policy of not institutionalising the home and a poster would look institutionalised. And so there was a kind of mismatch. And I wonder if that's something you've experienced and if you have ideas about how we might 
sort of move past that? I think the way to, well, it, I've not had that experience certainly in the last few years, but what I would say is, is moving forward, I think that what has to happen is that the, the Research Ethics Committee has to be cognizant of the fact that some of those people only work in this, for want of a better word, arid environment. Yeah. And I think what they have to take into account and speak to the people bringing the research forward is, well, why wouldn't you want to do that? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we ask you to do that? Yeah. Because we shouldn't be there dictating what, in essence, become a meaningful process. So it should be a conversation. Process, yeah. So it should be a conversation within the, the research ethics committee and the individuals. I see it. It's not. The process isn't inquisitorial at all. It's, it's exploratory. Yeah. That's and, then, like that. and so what you should be saying is, well, why do you want to do this? This is what we want you to do. Why won't it work? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, actually, if we look at where this person particularly is, the service use, this is their home. You wouldn't go around sticking a sign up in somebody's home going, uh, be aware that people will be under observation. Mm -hmm. This is not a, a, you know, this is not a petri dish. This is, this is somebody living environment. It's their yeah. real world. Yeah. So we, we shouldn't be involved in that. We shouldn't dictate meaningless processes for the point of view of tick boxes. So it's like when I teach my medical law students, we talk about consent forms. Well, they're meaningless. That's just a tick box. In yeah. essence, you don't need to sign one. It's just yeah. by process we do. Yeah. And so if you want fully informed your patient, if fully informed consent exists, then, you know, it's the discussion that's important mm -hmm. and the sharing of information and the listening. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about sort of empowering and listening and sharing rather than just going through the process. And I think that's how we need to deal with it. Yeah. So be more be more open to discourse, discussion and listen. Yeah. And sort of, I guess, finally, as a kind of rounding off, do you have any sort of, um, any sense or any thoughts of how we might move that discussion forward? What kind of resources or training or conversations kind of need to happen? Or? I think it's really interesting. And I think what needs to happen is we've all, we've all had a conversation about how people feel uh, adrift a bit in terms of uh, ethics and, and understanding ethics in the context of the application form because that, that's really what we're talking about. Yeah. We all have our own ethical and moral position uh -huh. and I don't think we should ignore that. And, and, yeah. and, and So I think what we need to do is actually, there should be more, more education for the people undertaking the process but we should also have an educational discussion within the people on the ethics committee yeah. to, to make them aware of other people's skill sets, other people's real world experience and how in reality research works in the real world when they're doing und undertaking practical real world research actually yeah. within a clinical setting yeah. and I think that's the conversation we need to have.